You're listening to Precinct 444, a podcast network from the National Law Enforcement Museum. Today we're bringing you an episode from Law and Disorder, where we dive into the world of true crime stories with memorable cases that have lasting effects for law enforcement. It's a balmy early summer night in the small rural town of Jasper, Texas. The date is June 7, 1998, and 49-year-old James Bird Jr. is walking home from a social gathering when a pickup truck carrying three white men pulls up beside him. James Bird Jr. is an African-American man who's well-known and well-revered in his hometown of Jasper. He'd lived and worked there most of his life, and he was incredibly active with his local church, revered by his community as an upstanding citizen. So it was no surprise that the driver of this white pickup truck, 23-year-old Sean Barry, knew Mr. Bird and offered him a lift home. James Bird accepted the offer and hopped into the truck. Little did he know that this seemingly kind offer was a trap that would lead to a racially motivated crime that would shock the conscience of this small Texas town and the nation as a whole. This is Law and Disorder, and today we are examining the shocking and gruesome murder of James Bird Jr. And if you're listening on the day that this episode is published, we are actually discussing the case on its 25th anniversary. When the murder of James Bird Jr. occurred in 1998, it almost immediately made national headlines. And when we get into the details of the incident and the investigation during this episode, you'll know exactly why. The crime from its inception was racially motivated, and the conversation about this case in the decades after verdicts were handed down have led to the creation of key pieces of legislation, both in the state of Texas and in federal law, that regard the investigation of hate crimes. As a note to listeners, the details of this case are incredibly disturbing and graphic, so listener discretion is highly advised. Born on May 2, 1949, in Beaumont, Texas, James Bird Jr. was the third of eight children born to Stella and James Bird Sr. The Bird family resided in the East Texas community of Jasper, Texas, and found the greatest sense of community within their church. At the Greater New Bethel Baptist Church, Stella was a Sunday school teacher, and James Sr. served as a church deacon, and the couple even found ways that their children could contribute to the livelihood of the church. James Jr. was a celebrated and talented musician by his family, and would often play piano during church services. In 1967, James Bird Jr. graduated from Jasper Row High School and was historically part of the school's last segregated graduating class. Bird had a stellar academic record and was encouraged by his parents to attend college as his two older sisters had. But instead, James decided to forego a college education and instead got married and started a family. He fathered three children, Renee, Ross, and Jamie. Bird worked as a vacuum cleaner salesman and, from the stress of rearing a young family, struggled with alcoholism, and he even spent a short stint in prison for petty theft. But in 1993, James Bird Jr. and his wife divorced, and in 1996, he returned to his hometown of Jasper, determined to turn his life around. He joined Alcoholics Anonymous and reinvigorated his involvement in the church. He was a charismatic family man, active in the lives of his three now adult children and a growing brood of grandchildren. And in the early morning hours of June 7, 1998, James Bird Jr. was walking home from a party. Bird suffered from seizures, which left him unable to drive, and Jasper was a small and safe enough town, walking really wasn't that uncommon. That same evening, Sean Barry, a 23-year-old Jasper local, had been driving around and partying with the two passengers in his pickup truck, fellow Jasper native 23-year-old John William King and 31-year-old Lawrence Russell Brewer, a man King had met during a stint in prison for stealing. While the three men are driving through town, they came across Bird on his path home. Barry had known Bird most of his life, both of them local to the small town. So when the young man pulled the truck over and offered to give James Bird Jr. a lift, it seemed innocent. But in reality, the offer was a trap set by Barry's passengers, who were a pair of white supremacists on the hunt for their next victim. When John William King was placed in the George Beto Unit Maximum Security Prison to serve a sentence for stealing, he quickly met and befriended Lawrence Russell Brewer, a notorious white supremacist. 
Upon their release from prison, the pair returned to King's hometown of Jasper, hardened racist criminals prowling for black blood. And James Byrd Jr. was their ideal victim. The fact that he knew the driver of the pickup truck well enough to trust him and accept a ride home made it easy to get him in their clutches. And the 49-year-old was mildly physically disabled. So at the hands of three men in their mid-20s to early 30s, it would be exceptionally hard for him to fight back. When James Byrd Jr. accepted that ill-fated ride home, he had no idea that he was making a fatal mistake. Bird climbed into the pickup truck, and instead of driving him home, Barry and his passengers took him to a clearing near a wooded area outside of town. Once there, Bird was pulled from the truck by King and Brewer and assaulted. The pair beat Bird mercilessly with fists and even a baseball bat. They taunted him and even urinated on him, but they were far from finished. King and Brewer chained James Bird Jr. to the back of Barry's pickup truck by his ankles, and they began to drive down Huff Creek Road also known as County Road 278, which is a deserted, unpaved rural highway, mainly surfaced with gravel. As his body was dragged along that gravel road, Bird sustained horrifying injuries. Nearly all of his ribs were fractured, and his head and right arm were severed when the truck hit a culvert in its route. After dragging Bird's body for nearly three miles, the men collected what was left of James Bird Jr.'s body and dumped it in front of an African-American church where it would be discovered before services later that Sunday morning. The city of Jasper is fairly small. In 1998, its population of roughly 8,000 was nearly equally divided racially between black and white residents, who were both religiously devout. The news of James Bird Jr.'s murder spread through the town's Black community very quickly, many learning of the incident after Sunday services the day he had been murdered. And it didn't take long for the news to spread between the Black Baptist churches of the region and the state, and eventually hit national and even international news. The investigation into Bird's murder began rather quickly, and from the gruesome nature of the murder, it was fairly apparent to investigators they were dealing with a racially motivated crime— an autopsy of Bird's remains showed that he suffered massive brush burn abrasions and that his knees, feet, buttocks, and left cheek had been severely worn down. The abrasions on the left cheek were so severe that his jawbone was exposed. And the severe trauma to his extremities left muscle tissue in his legs exposed. Some of Bird's toes were missing or fractured, and nearly every one of Bird's ribs were broken. A forensic examination of Bird's head, which had been separated from his torso when the truck hit that culvert about halfway through the drive, showed that his brain was still intact, and injuries to his face suggest that Bird attempted to keep his head lifted while his body was being dragged. These injuries led investigators to believe that, at least at the beginning of the attack, Bird was conscious while he was being dragged behind the pickup truck until his body ultimately gave out. In addition to the autopsy findings, immediate searches of the route where Bird's body was dragged and the location of where Bird's remains were ultimately found, police discovered 81 places along the route that included Bird's remains, as well as a wrench engraved with the name Barry and a lighter engraved with Possum, a nickname that had been given to King in prison, which led investigators to their first suspects and solidified their suspicions that the murder was a racially motivated crime. To investigators, Brewer and King were established white supremacists, and the suspicion of their involvement in the case escalated its classification to a hate crime, which led local investigators to call upon the FBI for assistance in the case, and the assistance would be based out of the agency's Houston field office. Agents stated that their involvement in the case was justified by the extreme circumstances of Byrd's death, and it only took a few days to arrest the suspects and begin preparing for their respective trials. In terms of the suspect's white supremacist history, John William King was a registered member of the Ku Klux Klan, and his body bore objectively racist tattoos, including a scene depicting a black man being lynched from a cross, Nazi symbolism, the words Aryan pride, and an image of a patch from a gang for white supremacist inmates known as the Confederate Knights of America. In a jailhouse letter to Brewer that was intercepted by officials, King expressed pride for his involvement in Byrd's murder. He realized as he was committing the murder that he might die as the cause and wrote that within the letter, 
In the letter he wrote, regardless of the outcome of this, we have made history, death before dishonor, and signed off with Zeke Heil, a notorious Nazi salute. An investigator from the case cited that witnesses mentioned that after beating Bird, King had referenced the Turner Diaries, a notoriously racist novel written by American neo-Nazi William Luther Pierce and published under a pseudonym in 1978. The book depicts a violent uprising in the United States that results in an overthrow of the federal government and an ultimate race war, which leads to the systematic extermination of non-whites and Jews. In this trial, John William King was convicted and ultimately sentenced to death by lethal injection. He was executed by the state of Texas at the Huntsville Penitentiary in Huntsville, Texas, on Wednesday, April 24, 2019. Lawrence Brewer's history of white supremacy was highlighted greatly during the trial for James Byrd Jr.'s murder. Prior to the murder, Brewer had served a prison sentence for drug possession and burglary charges, and he was paroled in 1991. But eventually, he violated the conditions of his parole, and he was sent back to prison in 1994, and that was where he met John William King. In his testimony to the court during his trial, Brewer stated that while he and King were inmates in the Beto Unit prison— they joined a white supremacist gang to protect themselves from other inmates. But as the trial went on and testimony was heard from witnesses and a psychiatrist in the case, it was obvious that Brewer felt no remorse for his role in the murder of James Byrd Jr., and he was painted in the prosecution's case as a racist psychopath. Ultimately, Brewer was found guilty and convicted of the kidnapping and murder of James Byrd Jr., and he was also sentenced to death. He served his sentence on death row at the Polunsky unit and was then ultimately executed at the Huntsville unit on September 21, 2011, by lethal injection. The day before his execution, Brewer was interviewed by the KHOU 11 News in Houston and expressed that even after serving his sentence on death row, he did not feel any remorse for his crimes. He was quoted saying, As far as any regrets, no, I have no regrets. No, I'd do it all over again to tell you the truth. The third suspect in the case was Sean Barry, the driver of the pickup truck who initially offered James Byrd Jr. the ride that would ultimately end his life. The prosecution's case against Barry was different than its cases against King and Brewer. They argued that while Barry had participated in the murder of Byrd, his motivations were not of a white supremacist nature, and it was asserted that while he was just as guilty as the other two men in Byrd's killing, he was a, quote, thrill killer, as opposed to a racist one. A thrill kill is defined as a premeditated or random murder that is motivated by the sheer excitement of the act. During his trial, Barry's authorities called three different black men to the stand to testify that Barry was not racist, and when Barry himself took the stand, he testified that he attempted to stop Brewer and King from attacking Bird until Brewer threatened to assault him in the same way. So when Brewer testified in Barry's trial, he asserted that Barry had actually slit Bird's throat prior to the three men dragging Bird behind the truck for three miles but the jury ultimately decided that there was little forensic evidence to back this claim. The jury also felt that Barry was the only one of the three men who showed any remorse for their actions in the crime, and as a result, Barry was spared from the death penalty in the case. Barry was convicted and given a life sentence for his role in the murder of James Byrd Jr., and as of 2020, Barry was living in protective custody in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice's Ramsey Unit and he will first be eligible for parole in June 2038, when he is 63 years old. The town of Jasper found itself shaken by the circumstances of this murder, especially with its racist motivations and utter lack of remorse shown by James Byrd Jr.'s three killers. And the reaction to the murder, especially for town leadership, tended to be divided between racial lines. For many in the white community, there was a great deal of denial regarding the racial motivations of the crime and a tendency to blame the media for making them look bad. Once the suspects were convicted and sentenced and the media left town, Jasper was left with a reputation as a hateful place. It became apparent to local civic leaders from both the black and white communities that the racist elephant in the room needed to be dealt with if the town were truly to move on and honor the life of James Byrd Jr., rather than focusing on the incredibly tragic and horrifying circumstances of his death. 
It was important to the community that it acknowledged the region's long and troubled history of racism that reached far back to the era of slavery and racial violence in the wake of Reconstruction. Lynchings had been as prevalent there as they were in other areas of the Deep South, and unfortunately, even in 1998, and to some degree today, some of those white supremacist ideologies remain along the margins. It was important, especially to Jasper's African-American community, that the region's past not be forgotten. But the community, both locally and beyond, came in droves to support the Bird family in overwhelming ways. In the days after Bird's murder, his funeral service was held at the family's local church, and it was flooded with mourners. Only 200 could fit in the church, and among them were Jesse Jackson, Reverend Al Sharpton, and the NAACP's president at the time. So another 600 mourners observed outside. It was NBA star Dennis Rodman who paid James Bird Jr.'s funeral expenses. And in the years and even decades after Bird's death, legislators would also work to surround the Bird family with support, creating legislation in both the state of Texas and federal law to protect citizens from horrific hate crimes like the one that killed James Bird Jr., on May 11, 2001, Governor Rick Perry of Texas signed into law the James Byrd Hate Crimes Act, which strengthened penalties for crimes motivated by a victim's race, religion, color, sex, disability, sexual preference, age, or national origin. But the activism sparked by Byrd's brutal murder was not finished there. Additionally, Byrd's family began working with the family of Matthew Shepard, who, in 1998, was a 21-year-old University of Wyoming student who was abducted, attacked, and tied to a fence where he was left to die simply because he was a gay man. We'll be talking about Matthew Shepard in a future episode. But these families worked together to pass the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act, which was signed into law on October 28, 2009 by President Barack Obama, and it manifests mostly as a BJA program, or Bureau of Justice Assistance Program, that bears both Bird and Shepard's names. The law actively supports state, local, and tribal law enforcement and prosecution agencies in their outreach to and education for the public about hate crimes. The program also supports victims, agency staff, and partners who have been impacted by these crimes. Furthermore, the program provides support to reimburse extraordinary expenses that are associated with the investigation and prosecution of hate crimes. And any hate crime is covered by this law. The legislation outlines the definition of a hate crime very clearly as any criminal offenses motivated by some form of bias toward the victims on the basis of their perceived or actual race, color, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, or disability. And the incredibly tragic death of James Byrd Jr. and its horrifying circumstances remain in our consciousness as Americans even 25 years later. This case was a stark reminder that discrimination and violence sparked by discrimination still lives within our communities throughout the United States. But the activism and ultimately both the James Byrd Hate Crimes Act of Texas and the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act now exist to keep our communities safer in the wake of hateful, bias-motivated actions and empower citizens to recognize the signs of hate crimes and bring justice to more victims of these atrocities. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Law and Disorder on the Precinct 444 Network. Tune in every Wednesday for new episodes from one of our four shows and find past episodes wherever you get your podcasts. A special thanks to Christopher Mitchell for producing and editing today's episode, and we will see you again here soon at The Precinct. Please subscribe to Precinct 444 on your favorite podcasting platform to stay connected and to receive our latest content as soon as it drops. We would love to hear from you. Send in your questions, comments, and feedback to precinct444 at nleomf.org. You can help us make our content even better. The National Law Enforcement Museum is located at 444 East Street Northwest in Washington, D.C., and is dedicated to telling the story of American law enforcement. We expand and enrich the relationship between law enforcement and the community through educational journeys, immersive exhibitions, and insightful programs. 
Find us online at lawenforcementmuseum.org and stay tuned for more podcast content from Precinct 444. Until next time, stay safe. We'll see you at the precinct. Thank you.